guys. Here is our last lecture for our ionic compounds unit. Um, today we're going to talk about naming ionic compounds that contain polyatomic ions. So you're going to need your periodic table. If you don't already have that out, make sure that you grab it because you're going to need to reference it as we go through these slides. So just like before, there are a lot of old pieces of information that you will be called upon to use again. So we're going to use the same crisscross method that we learned about last week. We're now going to also use our polyatomic ion chart. Now, for those of you that have periodic tables that were handed out at school, if you flip your periodic table over, there is a list of polyatomic ions on the back. I am also posting a copy of polyatomic ions on the webpage. So if you're at home, you are welcome to print one of those out or bookmark it. There are lots of different polyatomic ion charts on the internet. Um, I'm trying to give you a simplified one that contains the ones that we'll be using, but any one will work. And just like last week, our goal when we are writing our formulas is going to be to make a neutral compound because these polyatomics are ions, they have charges, and we're still trying to get those charges to add up to zero to make a neutral combination. So you're going to see a lot of the same thing again. So here we go. Polyatomic ions are charged units. They are groups of atoms of nonmetals that are bonded together in a way that acts like they're one thing, like they're a single unit. And like I said before, you're going to find them on the back of your periodic table. Now, I've snipped a little chart here for us just so to have as a reference so you can kind of see how this works. But if you look on any chart or the back of your table, what you're going to see is you're going to see a whole lot of combinations of nonmetals. But you're also going to see that they have charges and they have special names. So every polyatomic has a name and a charge associated with it. Most of these end in something other than IDE. So you'll notice that you've got like nitrate and nitrite, sulfate, sulfite. Some of you asked about this last week. When are we going to use those names? Because you've heard about them before. Well, now we are. So most of these end in things that are not ending in IDE. IDE is usually the clue that it's just a regular old atom from the front of your periodic table. Of course, there are always exceptions. So here there are the three big exceptions. Um, cyanide ends in IDE. So if you're looking forever on the front of your periodic table for an element called cyanide and you can't find it, flip it over, right? Also, um, hydroxide, you can see the little star here and here. Hydroxide is another one. And then peroxide, which is not actually on this one that I snipped, but it is on the chart from school, which is actually an O2 with a negative 2 charge is what peroxide is. So these are the three big exceptions that actually end in IDE, which is unusual. So your big red flag here is looking for things that do not end in IDE. Okay. Now it's really important that as you go through these, that you pay close attention to the spelling. Okay. You have to um, recognize that the spelling is important okay. because there are only tiny little differences between this N3, for example, NO2, and NO3 with a negative. These are three entirely different things. Now, you will notice that most of them are negatively charged, right? So these are all negatively charged. But we have to write the name exactly as it is on the chart because there's a big difference. Regular old nitrogen ion is nitride, but NO2 is nitrite, and NO3 is nitrate. Now you guys don't have to memorize these. You're always going to be allowed to use your chart, but you do have to copy them correctly off of your chart. 
you also have to recognize when you're dealing with a polyatomic ion. So when you see a formula, you have to know, oh, I should be flipping over my periodic table. And how are you going to know that? Well, I want you to think for a minute about everything that we've done so far has been a binary compound. Binary means that it only contained two different types of elements. Polyatomic ions up the number of atoms in your compound. That's why you see it up here written as ternary. So now you're going to see more than two elements. So if you see more than two elements, that's your red flag that it's probably a polyatomic ion in there. And most of them are negatively charged. I think on our sheet we only have one that is positively charged, which is the NH4+. So you should be looking for this negatively charged combination on the back of your sheet and then copying the name down exactly as it is written on your chart. So, of course, practice is the important thing. So here it says using the polyatomic list, highlight the polyatomic in the formula, and then name the compound. So I am asking you to do this in two steps, and the reason is, is you have to identify the polyatomic before you start putting the name together. So again, if you're at home watching, you might want to hit pause for a second and then come back and check. So first thing I'm going to do is go through and highlight the polyatomics. So here we've got all of our polyatomics highlighted. Once I know that I'm dealing with a polyatomic, then I know that I'm going to be using both sides of the periodic table. So we're going to use the same kind of naming that we have used before. Okay. We're going to use the first name of the metal. So this is magnesium. And then whatever this is, right off the back of the table, we just copy it down. So this one is sulfate. Here we have calcium, and again, we just pull this name right off the back of the table, spelling counts, nitrite. Okay. Now here we have iron, ah, but iron is in the middle of the periodic table, so that means we're going to have to put a charge in there. So it's iron something, and then NO3 is nitrate. So what is the charge on the iron? Well, let's look what we have here. We have three nitrates. Each nitrate is negative one, right? So if each one of these is negative one, that's one, two, three negatives. So that means that this iron must be plus three. So I'm going to put my Roman numeral in there. So we're pulling everything together that we've learned so far. This is 10. Again, it's in the middle, so I'm going to have to figure out the charge. But first, I'm going to write the words. Phosphate is right off the back of the periodic table. And look up the charge of the phosphate. It's negative 3. I have two phosphates. So that means that I have negative 6. Over here, this needs to be plus 6. Okay. There are three tens. So how positive is each one of these SNs so that they add up to 6? They must each be... Two. So I'm going to put a 2 in there. Okay. Now here I've highlighted two things. I've got my one positive polyatomic. Its name is ammonium. And I've got a negative polyatomic, sulfate. So again, I just pulled them right off the chart. And the last one here, regular aluminum. I don't have to put a Roman numeral here because aluminum is always 3 based on its location. And OH is hydroxide. So for naming these, again, we're going to just be copying things right off the periodic table and off the polyatomic chart. Your job here is to make sure that you know when you should be flipping over your periodic table and looking for things on the back of this chart. Now, let's talk about writing the formulas. Okay. It's going to be the same rules again. The only difference is that we are going to be on the lookout for polyatomic ions. Okay. And again, how do we know that there's polyatomic ions? Well, there's clues. We can notice that most of them don't end in IDE. So if we see a name that ends in something else, we better flip over our periodic table. Of course, there are those couple of exceptions, but you only have to know the three exceptions. 
We're still going to use the charges from the periodic table. We're still going to use Roman numerals if it's somebody in the middle. And we're still going to crisscross using the charges right off of the chart. Okay. So everything that we're doing is just building on what we've been doing before. Here, if you need more than one polyatomic ion, you must use parentheses around it, which we saw in the previous slide. I'm going to click back for a second just so you can see it. So you can see when I needed more than one of the polyatomic, how they were in parentheses. That's because we wanted to show three, for example, NO3s, not NO33. There's no such thing as NO33. So here's some examples for us. So here I've got calcium. Well, calcium is just a regular old metal, so I'm going to go through the steps here. I'm going to use the crisscross method. Calcium is plus two. Now, cyanide is not an element. It's a polyatomic. It is CN with a negative one charge. I treat this like a unit. I can't split it up or anything, but I'm looking and I need to crisscross the charges to make them neutral. So I need one calcium and I need two cyanide. So I make sure I put it in parentheses to show that I need two of those CN ions. Here's another example. I've got iron two phosphate. So iron is Fe. Remember that this Roman numeral is just telling me that that has a charge of plus two. Phosphate, A-T-E, means look on the back. Phosphate is PO4 with a negative three charge. These aren't the same, so I'm going to do the crisscross thing. Okay, so I get Fe3 and in parentheses PO4 with a two because there's no such thing as PO42. So again, just lots and lots of crisscrossing and practicing being very careful with how we write things down. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here are some practice problems for you. Okay, here you are going to write the formulas. Every little thing has to be correct. So make sure that if you're at home, you hit pause. And once you hit pause and you actually do them, then come back and check. So go ahead and hit pause, and then when you're done, unpause it and see if your answers match the ones that I put up. So here we have our answers, and you can see that I have potassium permanganate. This is my polyatomic. It's the MnO4. It's got a negative one, so one of each will do it. Here, lithium sulfate. I need two lithiums and only one sulfate. Now, I put parentheses around this. Um, truthfully, you don't need to put parentheses around your polyatomic if you only have one, but I know some students feel more comfortable with it. Um, technically, it's not correct, but I wanted to show you that it doesn't affect the formula any when you put this two here. Okay. So here we've got iron two. Remember, that just means that the charge is plus two, and nitrate is negative one. So when I crisscross, my two comes way out here outside of the parentheses. Ammonium is our one positive polyatomic. It's NH4. Chloride is just regular old chlorine. So there it is with minus one. Hydrogen is H. Cyanide is CN, and they cancel each other out. And then the last one, which is copper two hydroxide. So remember that the two just tells me the charge. And then I need more than one of the hydroxide, so I put it in parentheses to show that I need two OHs, not OH2. They're two different things. So parentheses, crisscrossing, and just careful attention to detail is all we need here. But as far as newness goes, really, it's just flipping over your periodic table and using the chart when you need to. Now, we're going to practice these in class for sure and get them turned in. I want to remind you that we have an assessment coming up. Our assessment will open up on Monday at 8 a.m. and it will close on Tuesday at 4 p.m. This is February the 1st and 2nd and you want to make sure that you do not miss this window. If you are in class normally on Monday and Tuesday, you will get to take it in class. If you are a Thursday, Friday student on your schedule, you will be taking it at home in this window of time. you got to take it during this window. It will close. You will need to, just like before, use your Chromebook because it will be locked okay, in quiz mode. 
you will be allowed to use your note packet, your periodic table, and your polyatomic ion chart, which is on the back of your periodic table, or again, if you're at home, it'll be separate. Um, so if you are at home and you need to print one of these out, make sure you do that before you open this up. Um, I am going to give you a shortened list, so if you have to write it down, if you don't have a printer, it will be shorter. Um, it won't be super long or anything that you have to worry about. So make sure you have these things available to you so that you can use them while you take your quiz. So Monday and Tuesday of next week is when we will take this assessment. It will include some covalent compound uh, naming and formula writing mixed in. Um, but not properties, um, I don't think. So I will um, get more information out about this. This is going to be a bigger assessment than the last one because usually we take one big test on all things bonding. Um, so I'll give you a little outline by um, the end of the week. But since these are open notes, it's not quite as big a deal as um, when it's not open notes, right? So I'll give you just a quick little outline of the topics that I expect to be on it um, so that you can make sure that you have all of your materials and um, things ready to go, okay? So this is the last lecture for this week. Make sure that you do the practice problems and you get those turned in sooner rather than later so I can give you feedback. Please make sure that you are actually making the effort to do them yourself. I know some of you are just Googling the answers and it shows because you don't know enough to know when you're copying an incorrect answer from Google. Um, you need to be able to do these yourself. You will not be able to Google them on the test, so um, don't sell yourself short by not practicing. Okay? Make sure that you're practicing and you understand how this works so that you can get the questions correct on the assessment. If you need help, make sure that you ask questions in class next week.